Hey, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to, I guess, episode two, as I'm going to call it, of Stir Crazy, uh, a new series, it turns out, in which I make coronavirus lockdown cocktails from home and teach you how to do the same thing. So last night we made uh, an old-fashioned and a Pisco Sour. Uh, again, the people voted today, and we've gone for a Sazerac. But again, like last night, I think I'm going to make a Sazerac and also a Vesper Martini. A Vesper Martini came in joint second place. Uh, both pretty fascinating drinks, uh, both delicious drinks, but both have got quite a lot of history with them as well. Uh, both drinks are going to be stirred, so we discussed this yesterday, but as they have all clear liquid ingredients, uh, no dairy and no citrus, we will not need to be shaking anything tonight. So in true kind of stir-crazy fashion, we will be building two stirred drinks. So we'll start with the, uh, the Sazerac, and there's a really interesting, in a perverse way, I guess, coincidental way, um, pertinent, right? Uh, sort of like a, I don't know, uh, an appropriateness to the Sazerac cocktail because uh, it's a cocktail that itself was also shaped by a pandemic. So traditionally, the Sazerac um, was made with cognac. And the Sazerac's a very, very, very historic drink. Some people argue, or they can't really prove it, there's a lot of contention, that the Sazerac is in fact the oldest cocktail. And it's a New Orleans drink, uh, very, very New Orleans. Um, and it was traditionally made with 100% cognac, right? The only sort of base spirit was cognac. But in the late 1800s, we're talking as late as sort of 1890s, uh, there was a worldwide kind of uh, phylloxera pandemic. And phylloxera isn't um, an illness that you'd contract as a human. A phylloxera is actually a tiny little bug, like a pest. And um, phylloxera is a bug that would eat grape plants, right? Eat the vines. But it was uh, native to North America, so it didn't exist outside of North America until uh, sort of British Victorian botanists traveling the world started to bring plants back from the North Americas back to the UK, back to England. Inadvertently, with it, they brought this tiny little bug called Phylloxera, which decimated pretty much all English vineyards, which if you ask me, if you've ever tasted English wine, is probably a good thing. Uh, but ultimately, it made it across the mainland Europe. And so Phylloxera, these tiny little bugs, these little pests, uh, almost completely obliterated European vineyards um, around the late 1800s to the point where it is suspected that anywhere between 66 and 90 percent of French vineyards were lost to the phylloxera epidemic. Uh, what that means is that during this era, um, a great time for classic cocktails, anything grape based was really hard to come by, especially outside of France. And brandy, cognac, sorry, is a grape based brandy. So that means that a lot of recipes around this time actually changed, and most of them changed from using cognac, uh, which is now basically impossible to get hold of, to using rye whiskey. So a lot of uh, Sazerac cocktails will actually use rye whiskey instead of the very traditional cognac. The spec that I'm going to build today is going to use both, right? It's going to kind of pay a bit of uh, credit to both parts of the, the, the drink's history. I'm going to combine rye and cognac to make my Sazerac. So as I mentioned, it is a stirred drink, so I'm going to grab my mixing glass, uh, my jigger, my bar spoon, and also I might as well while I'm here, measuring spoons, and a strainer. So anyone who tuned in last night, already well versed in sort of the practicalities of making drinks, uh, we are going to start with our cheapest ingredient first. And that is going to be, uh, behind me on here, this cocktail is going to contain just one dash of uh, Angostura aromatic bitters. Uh, very ubiquitous bitters, um, get it from almost any supermarket, any grocery. And we're just going to start with one dash of this. The next ingredient is the backbone. It is what makes a Sazerac a Sazerac. Uh, I don't want to kind of be a party pooper, but if you cannot get hold of this Peychaud's bitters, I would not recommend attempting this drink, right? It's as simple as that. A Sazerac is pretty much defined by the presence of Peychaud's bitters. Now, these are also a New Orleans invention. Uh, Peychaud's was named after the uh, particular cognac um, that was used to make the original Sazerac. Uh, Peychaud's has this beautiful red color, and it's going to give a really nice color to our final drink. This is going to uh, come in at four dashes, so four dashes of Peychaud's. Uh, next, I'm going to sweeten this drink up a little bit. And to do that, I'm going to use just 5 ml, 1 teaspoon of Demerara syrup. So Demerara syrup, really easy to make at home. 
you're just going to take two parts by volume of demerara sugar, one part water, and just boil it down on a stove top uh, until it's all dissolved. Cool it down, bottle it up, and that should last for a good week or two in the fridge. So to sweeten this up, five ml of demerara syrup. So I mentioned that this drink is going to sort of uh, pay homage to both aspects of the, uh, the cocktail's history. So I'm going to use cognac and rye. Anyone who tuned in last night will hopefully remember that uh, I'm a huge fan of rye whiskey. That kind of uh, spicy punch that it lends to any drink is just divine. Uh, the quantities I'm going to use is not 50-50. I'm actually going to use uh, less cognac. So I'm going to use uh, only sort of 15 ml of cognac. That's about half an ounce for the Americans. So 15 milliliters of cognac. Unfortunately, there is a pandemic and um, good alcohol is a little harder to come by, which again actually fits with the topic of the drink, I guess. Normally I would use something like Pierre Ferrand. Uh, Pierre Ferrand 1846 is a delicious cognac for cocktails. Uh, I'm slumming it tonight. All I've got in is some Remy. So some Remy Martin for this drink. And the um, whiskey uh, is going to be Old Faithful, probably every uh, bartender's most versatile rye whiskey is Rittenhouse 100. Absolutely beautiful whiskey, it lends itself really well to cocktails. For this, I'm actually going to do 45 ml. So, similar to last night, the overall alcoholic volume is 60 milliliters. So, 45 ml of whiskey to go against the 15 ml of cognac. Now, this is an especially boozy drink. This drink is strong. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back to the, actually what I'll do is explain this in the correct order. So what I'm going to do is, if you remember from, my goodness, I need to buy some more of this. Um, if you remember from last night, we add the ice as late as possible, and that's purely so that um, while I'm talking or while you're doing anything, this drink is not diluting. Everything in here is pretty inert at this point, it's fairly safe to leave it alone. So while that's just sat there doing absolutely nothing at all, I'm going to explain exactly why this is such a boozy drink. We're going to pop some absinthe in here. So basically we're dealing with a, um, a cocktail that has alcoholic bitters, right? These are alcoholic, although tiny quantities. Uh, my syrup is non-alcoholic, as you might expect, uh, but cognac, whiskey, and absinthe. Hold that up one second, I'm going to grab a glass. Now, the Sazerac is quite an interesting drink. It's going to be served uh, straight up, so no ice, which is means it's imperative to start with a very cold glass. That means that about an hour ago, I put this tumbler in the freezer uh, just to make sure that when the drink is served without ice, it remains cold for a long time. Now, the amount of absinthe in this drink is going to be very, very minor, and actually what we're going to do is what's called an absinthe rinse. Most recipes, most specs will tell you that the best way to do an absinthe rinse is just put maybe a teaspoon of um, absinthe in the bottom of the glass, rinse it around to coat the entire internal wall of the glass, and then just dump whatever's left in the, in the sink. That's unnecessarily wasteful. So what I tend to do if I'm doing an absinthe rinse is I just bought these little glass uh, atomizers. Don't use plastic. Plastic isn't good for storing uh, alcohol in. Little glass atomizers, like a little perfume bottle. And I'm just going to mist the glass, right? So it's very little waste. So what I'm going to do is ensure that the glass is, for the most part, oh, that's running low, so it's not coming out too easy. Um, oh, here we go, I should have checked this before I started. I might have to do a, a rinse. What I'm hoping to do with this absinthe is just rinse. There we go. Just rinse the inside of the glass so that it's fairly uh, sort of coated without enough. I don't want to put so much in there that it's going to cling and just cool in the bottom. That's going to be too boozy. So now that is just sat there doing its thing. It's time to stir this drink down. So I'm going to grab some ice, my mixing glass, uh, get this stirred down, get it diluted to the correct sort of um, uh, well, dilution, and then serve it. <coughs> okay, again, I'm dealing with very dry ice, which means it's going to dilute very uh, predictably. It means this drink is going to take a fair amount of stirring, but it's going to do so fairly consistently. As minimal contact as I can get away with the, with the mixing glass itself, not to transfer any of my body into this glass. 
And I'm just stirring this down, just gently nudging the blocks of ice around in the glass. I'm not trying to agitate anything, I'm not trying to push anything around forcefully. All I'm trying to do here is smoothly move this ice around the mixing glass. So a Sazerac is a very, very boozy drink, and what this normally means for me, I travel a lot for work, and I will often try and scope out the, the best bars in the city that I'm, I'm visiting. And um, as a kind of Pavlovian thing to myself, um, the moment I order a Sazerac, I know it's home time. And not because I'm drunk, uh, but because if I have any more than one Sazerac, I will be drunk. It's a perfect nightcap drink, so normally if I'm deliberately sort of ending the night, intending to go home, uh, I'll ask my bartender just to make me a split ride cognac Sazerac, and that, for me, signals bedtime. Oh, perfect. Spot on. So, I'm just going to uh, single strain this. It's not being shaken. The ice is still relatively intact. Now, when you shake a drink, the ice breaks into small shards. That's when you double strain the drink. This hasn't been shaken, so I don't need to do that. All I need to do here is a single strain, straight into a glass. And what's interesting about the Sazerac is... Um, Normally drinks that are served straight up, normally drinks that are served without ice, would be served in a coupe or a Nicanora or a martini style glass, purely for the aesthetic. This drink is not going to have any ice in there when we serve it, so it looks like just a neat whiskey. Um, what I'm going to do is one final blast over the top with my absinthe, just kind of mist that drink. As I mentioned last night, first taste is with the eyes, second taste is with the nose. So as someone lifts this drink to their mouth, they're going to get the aroma of these sort of uneasy wood, uh, sorry, um, the uneasy kind of, uh, is it woodworm? Which wood? Whatever it is. Uh, the, that sort of really medicinal ingredient in the, um, in the absence. Final thing with the Sazerac, um, it's all in the serving, I guess. Not only do we have no ice, we discard our garnish. So what I'm going to do is just get uh, a lemon twist from an unwaxed lemon. And this, is, this time you really don't need to care how the garnish looks, because what we're going to do with this is express the oils from the skin of the lemon, a little whiz around the drink just to leave some of that aroma, that fragrance, and we get rid of this. We don't need that. We don't serve it. This is exactly how a split-ride cognac Sazerac should look. Oh my goodness. See, already I'm thinking bedtime, but I'm not going to finish this because I'll be way too boozed in order to make the next ring. Give me one second, I'll rinse some equipment and we'll start the, uh, the Vesta Martini. Vespa is another fascinating drink. I'll explain it while I'm tidying up my battle station. So the Vespa was developed um, by Ian Fleming in 1953. He basically invented a drink for James Bond to order in the book Casino Royale, where it later became a film. And you can actually see the scene in which he sort of invents what he calls, or what ultimately became called, the Vespa Martini. Um, the spec, the ingredients that were asked for were kind of crude, a little bit rushed. Um, so what's happened over the last couple of decades is people have deliberately improved upon and steered the Vespa towards being a genuinely very delicious drink. The biggest problem with the Vespa, as it was originally uh, designed, is that Ian Fleming wrote it down as being a shaken drink. Uh, completely the wrong thing to do for that style of drink. It has no dairy, no citrus, no juice of any sort. So to shake a martini of any fashion is just going to betray that style of drink. It's going to ruin it. So the key sort of faux pas was the um, sort of the shaking of that drink. Once you get the spec correct, and it has been adapted over the last, like I say, several decades, and stir it, it becomes a truly beautiful, delicious, if not a little boozy drink. We're going to make one in a second. My uh, kit should be dry now, so I'm going to go and grab that. We're going to make the best part. So, 
Vespa martini uh, differs from most martinis, so actually I'll step back a little bit. If you order a martini, uh, any good bartender will ask you if you want a vodka or a gin martini. In my opinion, it would always be gin. Uh, vodka kind of lacks a lot of flavor that gin has. Uh, it's obviously a preference thing, but I much prefer a, a gin martini. A Vespa is both. It is gin and vodka. And it is also followed off, sorry, joined by uh, aromatized wine. Uh, you can't really call it a white vermouth. Um, a vermouth is a subset of aromatized wines. Uh, but traditionally, the original recipe called Burkina Lille. Now, there's a lot of kind of contention among bartenders. Uh, Kina Lille changed its recipe probably before I was born, right? It changed its recipe at some point. So a lot of bartenders maintain if you want to make a truly, um, you know, authentic Vespa Martini, you're going to need not Kina Lille anymore, but Cocky Americano. Apparently, Cocky Americano's current formula mimics fairly closely that of the original Kina Lille. I'm going to use neither. Because for this, I've got a little trick up my sleeve. This is just absolutely divine. This is uh, from Tempest Fugit Spirits, um, who were originally based in um, Bern, I think, in Switzerland. Tempest Fugit makes some delicious spirits. Uh, this is an aromatized wine called uh, Kina Lero d'Or, which is French for uh, basically the golden aeroplane. What this is ultimately going to do is uh, change the color of our Vespa to look a little different than what you might expect. Most Vespas and most martinis are going to be very crystal clear because they're predominantly just a white wine that's been aromatized and either gin or vodka. This, hopefully you can see, has a golden hue to it, right? Hence the golden aeroplane. This is going to make the most delicious Vespa you've never had. Um, I've said a few times about using the cheapest ingredient first. This is actually the most expensive, or for me at least, the most difficult to source ingredient, uh, but it does have the smallest quantity, so you do get a bit of a quandary. I do not want to waste this. This is absolute liquid gold, almost literally. Uh, but I am going to pour this first, because there is the smallest quantity of that. With it being an aromatized wine, the ABV is quite low, so where most spirits can be left on a shelf indefinitely, they will not go bad. There isn't enough alcohol in this to keep it fresh outside of a fridge. So if you're going to be dealing with uh, vermouths, aromatized wines, and you're not going to get through you know, a bottle a week, which I certainly haven't, you want to buy a vacuum van, and what that will do is basically suck all the air out of the bottle, so we keep it in the fridge, there's very little air contact with that liquid. So if I pop the cork, that is now ready for using. For this, we just want a 15 ml, really small amount of this stuff, so it's going to be 15 ml of the uh, uh, layer of raw. Uh, 15 ml is about half an ounce for anyone who uses the imperial system. Uh, 15 ml of this. The next biggest ingredient is going to be the vodka. Now, I'm not much of a vodka drinker. I don't necessarily dislike vodka. I just don't do much of it. But what you want to do is get a fairly decent vodka. What I'm using here is Kettle One. Uh, Kettle One is delicious. I believe it's Dutch. Um, a very, very good vodka indeed. Um, and what we're going to do is 22.5 milliliters of this. So 22.5 of my vodka. The reason we're using 22.5 is because we're about to actually double up on the amount of gin. Because against the 22.5 vodka, we're going to sit 45 gin. Now, I've never actually made a vessel with Gordon. So like I mentioned, there is a um, pandemic happening right now. I'm running low on my good stuff. What I'd normally use is a Plymouth gin for this. It's quite almost buttery, really nice. Um, run out of Plymouth gin, can't restock at the moment. I'm actually using Gordon's Export Strength, which is basically identical to what was used in the original 1953 recipe, right? Bond or James uh, Ian Fleming. Uh, he called specifically for Gordon's gin. Well, let's see how this goes. So it's basically one part of vodka to two parts gin, so 22.5 ml vodka against 45 ml of my gin. Uh, because this is Gordon's export strength, it comes in at a 47.5% ABV. This is pretty boozy. Um, between my Sazerac and my Vespa, um, I'm gonna be getting pretty buzzed tonight. So with this drink, all clear liquids, all clear ingredients, no ice, you have to stir it down. Um, pro tip, I guess, um, to completely transform any drink, keep your glasses in the fridge, uh, sorry, freezer. Uh, a cold glass is the bartender's equivalent of a chef keeping your plate warm, right? It will just 
preserve that drink and make it a little more as the bartender intended for longer. So I'm going to grab some ice and I'm going to grab a, uh, a frozen glass, stir this down, stir it up. Again, this drink, uh, like the Sazeraki, is going to be served straight up, so no ice. Um, but more commonly, as I sort of alluded to earlier, um, a no ice sort of straight up drink would normally be served in a martini glass or a coupe or a Nicanora. Uh, a Nicanora is pretty it's weird, but I've got a favorite glass. A Nicanora is probably my favorite glass, and it's somewhere between a coupe and a sherry glass. So it's uh, quite a long stem, quite a squat body. Um, and that's going to be a really nice drink to serve anything like um, a Bucare or a Martinez. For this martini, understandably I'm going to be using a martini glass, and again, minimal contact with the mixing glass, nudging that ice around, trying to keep the bar spoon as vertical as possible, just as I nudge that ice around. So, this is going to be a very boozy drink, so it might come in a bit too hot. Yeah, I'm going to stir that down a little bit more. And what's really nice with this drink is, using a fairly boozy, fairly strong gin, you do get that exactly what you need, that boozy content, that boozy flavor from a martini. But the Kinkina Lera d'Or um, gives a slightly vegetal, slightly herbaceous taste. Um, it is an aromatized wine like Kina Lele, um, like Coffee Americano, uh, but for me it's just got a little bit of something else. And it does have kind of a rich, buttery feel that goes really nicely against the booze of the other ingredients. That's bang on, that's right there. So this... And you can see it's not perfectly clear. It almost looks a bit syrupy and viscous. It, it isn't, right? It's very thin, it's thin liquids, but that's got a really sort of subtle hue to it that looks delicious. Um, for this drink, we are gonna garnish it, um, again with lemon, but this time we're not gonna discard the garnish. You would leave the lemon in the glass. Normally what I would do is I just use a real quick peeler just to get a strip of, uh, of lemon skin. Uh, normally what you do is get a little sort of fruit knife and just trim on a little bar mat, trim the edges, make it look pretty. Um, that's just far too time consuming to do on a live stream. What's really nice, and you definitely can't get this off a simple iPhone sort of feed, is as you express the oils, you do see little speckles of citrus oil just landing atop, across the top of the, uh, the drink. It looks really, really nice. Um, again, just whiz around the outside, a bit at the stem perhaps. I'm just gonna try and float this nicely on top. And there we go, the Vesta Martini. So there we have two really, really classic drinks. Um, queried, potentially the oldest cocktail in existence, and a modern classic, or a twist on a classic, the Vesper Martini. Um, its initial spec wasn't the best, but bartenders have worked over the last several decades to kind of uh, tweak it and improve it and make it into a genuinely enjoyable drink. So hope you enjoyed that. Stay safe. Have a good rest of your weekend, and I'll catch you next time. Yeah, okay.